So tonight we're talking about um, epic events in the heartland of Israel. And I'm going to explain in a moment exactly what that term means and how it's used today in a few minutes. Um, but generally speaking, for, um, for, the, for, the, for this moment, it refers to what is uh, commonly known as the West Bank um, or Judea and Samaria. And I'm going to show you in a few details uh, why it's called that in a few minutes. What you're looking at on the screen right now is um, just south of Jerusalem near Bethlehem. Before 1948, there were um, some Jewish settlements just south of Jerusalem in that area. It's called Gush Etzion. And, um, and this is what it looked like at that time in 1947. And that's what that area looks like today. It's an absolute incredible transformation that is happening in the land of Israel, physically, that the land is changing. And we, we just read in uh, Amos chapter 9 that God says, I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they also shall make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land. And what you're looking at there is vineyards in Gush Etzion, just near Bethlehem, in those Jewish communities. And there's the verse from Amos that we just read, read together. Uh, but where I was standing taking this picture, what I'm, I'm standing on is this um, promenade. It's called the Boys Promenade. And this was made uh, in commemoration uh, to remember three teenagers that were kidnapped and murdered by the Hamas terror group in 2014. And so they built a memorial for these boys, out looking out over the, uh, the Jerusalem hills, and you're looking down toward the coast from Gush Etzion, which is a, a, a block of Jewish communities in the, in the West Bank. So on this uh, promenade, it has different um, uh, memorials or plaques like this, to remember each one of these three teenagers. Uh, this is one of the boys called Naphtali, and that's uh, the memorial that's about him. What it reminds us of, too, is that of the trouble that the Jews go through that live in these areas. It's not an easy place to live. There's been a lot of terrorism. It's, it's less today. But nevertheless, there is still terrorism. Just after uh, we were there recently, we went to a grocery store at the Gush Etzion Junction. And uh, after we got home, there was a man that was uh, uh, murdered by terrorists just outside that grocery store. And so it, it is a difficult place to live. And that's created a special character. I mean, you can imagine that if in Ontario that if the, the, the Bradford and Norfolk County area was a pretty troublesome area to live in, that there would be either less people that lived there or people that had some special reason to live there. Because if I could live anywhere in Ontario, but in Norfolk County there was more terrorism and the land was contested and it was very difficult to live there, I'd probably go and live somewhere else. And so in those areas, it has, generally speaking, uh, has a special type of person that lives there for um, an ideological reason. And by the way, uh, if you're interested in, in music, I think you can actually even just get this off iTunes. Uh, there's a song written to commemorate uh, the three boys. Uh, it's called Open Your Heart. If anybody's uh, interested, I could probably send you the link or um, and also send you a translation of the words if you're interested in that very beautiful piece of music to remember the three boys. Now, the reason that those people live there then is an ideological reason. It comes from their belief in the Bible. And the reason that we have an interest in that area and in those people that live there and why they live there is because of our ideology, because of our faith. And we're familiar with the statement of faith that was written 150, over 150 or 150 years ago that um, expressed this interest in our faith. 
and something that was hoped for, something that at that time uh, was a matter of faith. It was something that hadn't been accomplished. So in our statement of faith, it says that the kingdom which shall, which he, the Lord Jesus Christ, will establish will be the kingdom of Israel restored in the territory it formerly occupied. That is the land bequeathed for an everlasting possession to Abraham and his seed, the Christ, by covenant. So the kingdom that's going to be established is going to be the kingdom of Israel restored in the territory it formerly occupied. And we just read in Amos about building the way cities. And you'll notice that in our statement of faith, it quotes Amos chapter 9, verse 11. In that prophecy of one of the reasons that we believe that, that those waste cities would be built again. And so we're going to look at some of those waste cities that have been uh, built again uh, this evening. Also, in uh, uh, the next clause, it says that this restoration of the kingdom again to Israel will involve the ingathering of God's chosen but scattered nation, the Jews. Their reinstatement in the land of their fathers when it shall have been reclaimed from the desolation of many generations, the building again of Jerusalem to become the throne of the Lord and the metropolis of the whole earth. And that's amazing, brothers and sisters, that that's in our statement of faith, and it's largely fulfilled. A lot of that clause 22 is fulfilled now, and it wasn't when our brethren, our brother Roberts wrote that down. In Alpha's Israel, we're familiar with these quotations, but let's just think about it. The restoration of Israel, wrote Brother Thomas, is a most important feature in the divine economy, the divine order of things. It is indispensable to the setting up of the kingdom of God, for they are the kingdom, having been constituted such by the covenant of Sinai. So we have a lot of interest in Israel, in the restoration of Israel, in the Jewish people, What's happening to them, how they're progressing in their thought, how they're still coming back to the land, what's happening in the land. All those things are very, very interesting to us because of our faith, our statement of faith that we see being fulfilled and what our, our early writers wrote that we also believe in. But as Brother Thomas wrote about the return of the Jews, he also recognized that they were in unbelief and that that unbelief had to change. And here he's writing about Psalm 110 where it says about them being willing. So he writes, Israel after the flesh has to be made willing to move to the obedience, in obedience to the commands of Jesus as the leader and commander of the people. Psalm 110 verse 3. This may be also the mission of angels, but this work of the Spirit, however, executed by the angels or by the saints, it would seem to be a necessary preliminary to a general movement for their deliverance. And this is after the order of the type. So Brother Thomas is saying that after the, when the Jews go back to the land, there also has to be a change in their thinking that has to happen after they go back to the land. Because he wrote, as we all know in Elpis Israel, that they were going to return in unbelief. But he's saying that that has to change. That, that way of thinking has to change um, and as we know, as the Jews returned in, in 1948, 47, 48, and, and before that, it was a secular movement and unbelieving people that did not believe in God. That's who that early return was led by, a godless people. So Brother Thomas said that's got to change. Their way of thinking has to change. And so as we watch the Jewish people in the land of Israel, we're very interested to see any change in that way of thinking, from being a godless way of thinking to a way of thinking that's more in tune with the word of God. Now, this is the, uh, the quote from John Thomas that we often quote, but I just want to think about this carefully for a moment and, and, and just see what he's saying. He says, there is then a partial and primary restoration of Jews before the manifestation, the return of Christ which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the, rest, uh, in the restoration of the rest of the tribes after he has appeared in his kingdom. So we saw that those Jews that we've seen return were to be a nucleus. They were to be a basis for operations of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so we can see that if they are going to be a basis for operations of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they're going to have to change their thinking. They're going to have to be converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to have to become biblical people because you can't be a nucleus or basis for God's kingdom unless you're biblical people. And so that change had to take place. Now, we said about the biblical heartland. What do, what do we mean when we talk then about the biblical heartland and why do Jews call the West Bank the biblical heartland? Well, part of it is, what they're referring to is this part inside what's called the Green Line, which is known as the West Bank. So see this Green Line? And the interesting thing is if you actually look at a satellite image of Israel, you can see the Green Line because on this side it's been um, planted with trees and cultivated and brought to life, and not so much on this side. Because before 1967, this was part of Jordan. So part of the reason that they would call it the biblical heartland is to draw attention to the many Jewish uh, important places that are there. But really, when you, when you actually start to appreciate it, you can see that it is, in fact, the biblical heartland. Because the, the, under Joshua, the Jews uh, came here. They came across the Jordan River, and they came into Israel right here. So they took Jericho and Ai, then they went up to Shechem. And then uh, they also went down in this area. Now, let's just think about the first, we call the first three capitals of the nation of Israel. Well, the first one would, we could probably call Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was for about 400 years, and it's where Samuel, the prophet, uh, began the great transformation that really brought the kingdom of Israel under David into, into effect. The second capital we could say was Hebron, because that's where King David first reigned as king in Hebron for the beginning part of his reign. And it was only then that the throne then moved to Jerusalem after, after King David took it. So all those capitals are in the West Bank. Even technically Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem, is in, is in the West Bank as far as it, it is if you talk about what was um, uh, before 1967. When Abraham came into the land, he came in from up here, and the first place he visited is Shechem. And then he traveled down this road, which today is called Route 60, that we've talked about before. He traveled from past Bethel, past Jerusalem, past Bethlehem, and to Hebron, and then down to, to Beersheba. So you see that Abraham's road and the, and the way of the forefathers, as it's called today, runs right down here. And you can go then to city after city and place after place throughout that area and see that really that is the heartland of the ancient kingdom of Israel. And that's why it's called the biblical heartland today. But it's not an easy place to live. It's a place that only became part of the state of Israel um, after 1967. Isn't really officially part of the, the nation of Israel today. Any of the nations of the world uh, will, will not say that that is part of the nation of Israel. It's contested. And sometimes people have been, uh, uh, communities have been destroyed because, um, because the, the land is contested. So it's a difficult place to live. There's probably um, more danger uh, in that area because, as you, as you will probably know, there's, there's Palestinian cities in that area where uh, Jews are not allowed to go into them. Um, so, and one of those cities is the city of Hebron. Now, when we were in Israel and we wanted to do some touring there, uh, we, we did some on our own where we were fairly uh, familiar with some of the roads. Um, but um, when we, we wanted to go into the city of Hebron, we did have a guide for that. And it's definitely advisable to do so. And I, I talked about this guide uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, his name's Gilly Holt. And uh, excellent guide. He's a he's a, a guide and also a professional cantor in the synagogue. And he has his Bible with him as he's guiding you because he's a believer in the Old Testament. Doesn't believe in the New Testament, but he's a believer in the Old Testament. He believes in prophecy being fulfilled, and he likes to tell people about these things as he's guiding them. And this is on the steps up to the cave of Machpelah 
in, in Hebron. Um, just when I was um, talking in the exhortation, I was saying about how we were traveling out of the city of Jerusalem through what is known as the Tunnels Highway um, by Bethlehem, where they've, they've built these massive tunnels through um, some of the, the hills to protect the road from rock throwing and so forth from Bethlehem. And as we went into the tunnel, he said, would you mind, and I'd only just met him an hour or so before, um, he said, Do we, would you mind if I said the prayer for the way? And I said, sure. Um, so the whole way through the tunnel, the most beautiful singing uh, you've ever, ever heard, uh, right through the tunnel as he, as he sang this prayer for the way, because we were going out um, on the way to go touring that day. Um, but that's just an example of the type of person that you're going to find in the West Bank. Very special people who live there um, for, for their ideology because they believe in the Hebrew prophets. And so many of them live in the West Bank for those reasons. Other people may live there too um, because of the, maybe the type of housing or whatever, but the majority live there um, because of their ideology. And we read in uh, Amos about the um, about the waste cities being built again, and this is just an amazing example of that because this is in the city of Hebron, one of the small Jewish communities in, within the city of Hebron. The city of Hebron is something like ninety-seven percent Arab and about three percent Jewish. One street that has little Jewish neighborhoods on it, four little Jewish neighborhoods. And uh, this is one of them. So there's some little, almost like trailer homes down here that were some of the first homes in Hebron. And, uh, and then they built this apartment building. But what you're seeing right here is the what was the entrance into the ancient city of Hebron. Somewhere along here, when you get to the gate, is most likely where Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah to bury, bury Sarian because of as we know, deals were done in the gate of the city. So that's how the amazing archaeology that you're standing on right here, and talk about the way cities being built again. I'm going to show you a picture of underneath this apartment building. The ancient ruins of Hebron are underneath the apartment building. So instead of just building the building and, uh, and burying the ancient ruins, They've elevated the building up, so the ancient ruins are still accessible underneath. And so that is just such a wonderful example of the fulfillment of the words of Amos, that the waste cities would be built again. Isaiah also says, Isaiah 61 verse 4, They shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities the desolations of many generations. Now, they haven't, there hasn't been any building in Hebron for probably 20 years. And so this is how things are changing. Is that just in the last couple of days, they've announced a new neighborhood being built in the city of Hebron. And that is just amazing. The amazing change that's happened. And, and we noticed this as we traveled around in the West Bank, in the biblical heartland, that there was building now going on. It was frozen all during the Obama years and before that as well. Very little building was happening. And now we see a big change taking place. There's, there was building in Gush Etzion, There was building in Shiloh. And now there's building in Hebron. And those are just the places um, that we uh, were able to visit. There's a lot of work being done at Shiloh right now in the, in the realm of archaeology. And I'm sure we'll be finding out more as that progresses. And our own brother, Lane Rittmeyer, had been there just a few months before we were there. And so as we're walking around and so much has changed, they've done so much work and it unearthed so much more of the ancient city of Shiloh. Uh, we, we were thinking about brother Lane Rittmeyer. But the amazing thing here, again, is that here's the, the ancient waste. Here's the ancient city of Shiloh. And right here, all above it, on the hilltop, is the restored city of Shiloh. Again, the ancient wastes being rebuilded. Absolutely incredible. And as you go through the West Bank, we're all familiar with the words of Ezekiel, uh, that gold comes down on the mountains of Israel. And, and they don't build the, the cities 
in the valleys throughout the whole West Bank. All the cities are built on the hilltops like this. And uh, we stayed in one in one village um, where I took this picture from, which is another Jewish hilltop community. And here's a smaller one on this hill. And throughout the uh, the West Bank area, you see all these little uh, villages on the hilltop, some of them bigger than others. I've shown the, uh, this community before. This is the community of Eli, just south of, uh, or just north of Shiloh. And uh, this is uh, another little community on another hilltop. We're going to be talking about this um, shortly. This is where um, the Land of Israel Network is and uh, where uh, a man called Jeremy Gimpel is doing some amazing work. Uh, this is just south of that in a place called Mayon Farm. Uh, again, on the very edge of the desert. What was desert and now there's vineyards um, growing. So this is in the region of Mayon and Carmel, where David was um, protecting the sheep of Nabal and where Abigail was from. So in the uh, just south of the wilderness of Judah, okay, and, and on the side of the Dead Sea. I'll show you on a map here in, in, in a couple of minutes. And here's looking south from that place, and that's a pomegranate tree growing and more vineyards in behind there. Okay, so the focus of what we're going to now talk about this evening is a, about a place that we visited in the wilderness of Tekoa, next to a place called Ale Amos, which is the heights of Amos. It's named after Amos the prophet. So as you might be able to see here on the map, this is En Gedi, down by the Dead Sea. So if you go up from En Gedi, you can see there's sort of like a, what's called a wadi or a river bed, a dry river bed, that comes from Malay Amos and comes down toward En Gedi. And just north of here is Tekoa. Okay, and we're going to look at that in a moment because there's some significant events that took place there. As a matter of fact, the prophet Amos that we've been uh, referencing, um, obviously this is named after the prophet Amos because he was of the herdmen of Tekoa. And so we're going to look at that. Um, and just north of here then, you can see Bethlehem and Jerusalem. So that's that's where we are. Um, by the way, Hebron is right here. Okay? So, um, And this is the dividing line. If you go uh, here by Malay Amos, uh, north of here is the wilderness of Judah, and then south of here is what is known as the wilderness of Ziph, which you may remember from uh, from the stories of King David. So, oh, there we go. There's I forgot I had highlighted everything for us. So um, let's just notice this though too, because uh, on the bottom here you can see it says Carmel. So this is where uh, Nabal is from Carmel, and then just south of here is Mayon, where Mayon Farm, where I showed you those pictures. Okay, so that's on the edge of the desert. You can see that this is total desert after you get past here. And uh, really anything from this dividing line and toward the east is desert, whereas when you head here toward the coast, it becomes more lush. Not It's not lush, but it's uh, there's a lot more trees and, and green that uh, you'll find in that direction. So if we just zoom in here a little bit more, um, you can see those places again on the map. So here is Tekoa, and this is uh, an Arab town that also has a name very similar to Tekoa, to Tekoa. And so this is uh, also probably could be the original site of Tekoa, uh, because the name has been changed, but it's still recognizable as being Tekoa. And, uh, and as you can see down here, is Malea Moss, and the place that we're going to uh, go and visit is right here. And it's just outside of this little um, community, right here, and just out in the wilderness, a uh, very lonely uh, place, really. In the wilderness of Judah, and just on the north of the wilderness of Ziph. So here's... Um, Here's those two places. So here's uh, Malay Amos, and um, here is the other community. It's called Abi Hanacha, right here. And then so we're going to go right down here to to this place. 
where the Land of Israel Network is, uh, is our, our building their headquarters. So that's just got that circled there for us. So this is looking from, from the Land of Israel Network headquarters, looking toward the Dead Sea, looking down that uh, dry riverbed that I showed you on the, on the satellite map. So this is that dry riverbed. I think if you eventually follow this, you're going to come down to En Gedi. And I believe this may be uh, Masada. You can see Masada from here um, if you look in that direction. And if you look in the other direction, you can just see Jerusalem. And uh, this is the community here that I showed you called Malay Amos, and named after the prophet Amos. So you, that gives you a really good idea of the type of topography and the type of land uh, that looks quite hostile. I don't think any of us would look at that land and, and decide to go there and make a farm or to grow anything. Um, and, and yet that's what's being done. But before we look at that, I want to look at a, a few passages in the scripture that um, help us to um, see the biblical significance and the type of things that took place in, uh, in this area of Malay Amos and the wilderness of Ziph and Tekoa. So let's turn to the first one, which is 1 Samuel chapter 23, where David is fleeing from Saul. So 1 Samuel chapter 23, and we're going to come in at uh, verse 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah, and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbore to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the hill country in the wilderness of Ziph. So that's just exactly what you're looking at there. And Saul sought every day, but God delivered him out of his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan saw son arose and went to David in the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And in verse 19, it tells us then about how the Ziphites um, came to Saul to, to Gabeah and told him that David was hiding in this area. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to um, listen to an interview uh, with Jeremy Gimpel from the Land of Israel Network, and uh, he's going to reference the fact that David was in this area for quite a lot of time and how that David wrote, wrote many of the Psalms before he became king. And so that many of the Psalms would have been written in this area in the wilderness of Ziph. Now we want to turn to Second Chronicles and chapter 20. And this is very significant. We're not going to um, go into this tonight too much, but in... Second Chronicles is the war of Jehoshaphat with Ammon and Moab, who had come over from the other side of the Jordan and come into this area. Uh, they were at En Gedi, uh, it tells us. And then there was a battle that took place. And it's typical of, of uh, the Battle of Armageddon in many ways. So there's very, some very interesting parallels in here. So it tells us in Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1, it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And there came some that told Jehoshaphat saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be at Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. So I showed you on the map that En Gedi is just down um, from, uh, from this place, from uh, Malay Amos. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Let's just skip down to verse 20. So it says, and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. So this is exactly where 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is taking place, right here. This is the wilderness of Tekoa. We're just south of Tekoa in, in the wilderness. 
They arose early in the morning and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments and defeated this uh, this um, group of, of nations that had come against Jehoshaphat and against Judah to battle. So the valley, it tells us in verse 26, uh, becomes called the, uh, the valley of Bracha, the valley of blessing. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of blessing. For there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Racha unto this day. And I, I don't know, but it could be this valley because this valley actually um, when, uh, winds south and comes out near En Gedi or at En Gedi. So it's quite likely that this could be the very Valley of Racha and that the ambushments would have been on the sides of the valley as they um, uh, as Judah was on the sides of the valley and they had ambushments down into that riverbed and defeated the Ammonites there. All right, now we just want to look at a couple of verses in the prophecy of Amos. We had an introduction from there, um, from the prophecy that applies to our time at the end of Amos. But the whole of the book of Amos has uh, messages for us. Amos chapter 1 tells us the words of Amos who was among the herdmen of Tekoa. So this prophet is from this place. This is where Amos had tended his sheep, right here in these hills, uh, right near Tekoa. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of jo Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Isn't that significant to us? That was the, the greatest earthquake of its time. And even when we come to Zechariah, he's referring back to the earthquake in the days of Zion. And Zechariah is prophesying after the exile, hundreds of years later, and yet that is still the reference. The earthquake in the days of Uzziah. And this prophecy, Amos, is two years before the earthquake. And he's from down here in Tekoa, and he goes up into Israel to prophesy against Israel in those days. Verse 2, he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. A prophecy against Israel. The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Isn't that true? It's, it's the time that we live in. We can see it reflected in the words of this prophet. When we turn over to chapter 7, Verse 14 says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. And he, he, I think he means there that he wasn't one of the sons of the prophets. But I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. So it was Yahweh that raised up Amos to be a prophet. And Amos was one of the poor of the people. A, a gatherer of sycamore fruit is of the very poorest uh, occupations. It's not a job that, uh, that any of us would want to have. And that's what Amos had for a job. And it was in these hills that he was a herdman. And God raised him up and took him to be his prophet. So we said that it was in these hills that David fled from Saul. And this is a map of, of, of that time in David's life. Here's the wilderness of Ziph. So those pictures are taken from right here on the very end, uh, bottom part of the wilderness of Judah, looking south into the wilderness of Ziph. So here's En Gedi, right here. And uh, this is Maon, where I showed you the pictures uh, from Maon and Carmel. 
So this is all that region where David spent a lot of his time when he was fleeing from Saul in that area. Now I've shown you those pictures of the desert. And that desert is slowly being transformed. As, as difficult as it may be even to imagine that you could do anything there. Um, but what we discover that um, those farmers there, Jeremy Gimple, Ari Abramovitz, and, and some, uh, a couple of others, are working there, and there are 4,000 fruit trees now planted in that area. 4,000 fruit trees. Let's just read that verse again in Amos. I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They also, uh, they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. We see that, that process beginning to take place. And it, it, it's a miracle that I've come to appreciate is that for 2000 years, as the Jews were outside of the land of Israel, it was desolate. It didn't bring forth fruit for anybody. It was a desolate land until the Jews came back and now it's starting to to bring forth fruit. It's starting to flourish. And uh, this is just a, a foretaste of what it will be like in the kingdom age. There's another one of those little fruit trees in the desert. And, and these fruit trees are all the species of the land of Israel, pomegranates and figs and, and, and so forth. That's the, the picture that we had at the beginning. And not only is there 4,000 fruit trees, there's also 2,000 vines because there's vineyards. So there's fruit trees and vineyards growing as this land becomes uh, transformed. Uh, and here's one of the, uh, the gentlemen, Jeremy Gimpho, um, who moved out into that wilderness to uh, build a place for his family to build a place for learning of the Torah and to uh, make a place that people could come and visit and, and see uh, what's happening. So uh, when we were in Israel, we really wanted to, um, to have an opportunity to see what was happening there, I'd heard about, and, uh, and to be able to talk with uh, Jeremy Gimpel. So I'm going to play now uh, an interview that I did with Jeremy Gimpel. And it's uh, about 13 minutes uh, long, and um, hopefully the audio will be clear enough. There was some wind, and there were some fighter jets going overhead at the time, but um, uh, the audio, I think, will be acceptable. So let's uh, go ahead. So tell me a little bit about where are we in the land of Israel, and why is this place special? Sure. Um, so let's first start historically, where we are biblically. Um, this is the northern edge of the mountains of Zif. And the mountains of Zif are a very special place. In the 23rd chapter of the book of Samuel, it says that David ran to the mountains or the wilderness of Zif when he was running away from Shaul, when he was running away from King Saul, before he became king. And so all of these mountains and all of these caves, there's caves all over here. For years, David lived here um, as he was hiding for Saul on his way to becoming king. Um, Jewish tradition has it that most of the book of Psalms was written by David before he became king. Only if there's like a special note where it says, to the conductor, that was already maybe afterwards. But so many of the Psalms that we read were written in this place. And so why did he come here? Well, Bethlehem is about 10 minutes this way. Jerusalem is about 20 minutes that way. Hebron is about 30 minutes that way. So really we're in the heart of Judea. But more importantly, David, when he took his sheep out as a young boy, these were the mountains that he knew. This was his backyard. So he knew all these mountains and all these caves. Saul had no chance of finding him here. But really the beginning of King David's kingdom, the beginning of his journey, the beginning of the Messianic dynasty, um, it really began right here. And so today if we talk about what we're doing in Israel, up at the top there is a Jewish community called Pnei Kedem, and a Jewish community right here with those red roofs called Maleamos. And it was called Ma'ale Amos after the prophet Amos, who also received his prophecy right in these mountains. And so Pnei Kedem, our headquarters and our farm here in Ma'ale Amos, is the deepest Jewish settlement in Judea today. So from here all the way to the Dead Sea 
and to eventually Jordan, um, this is as far as the Jewish people have gotten in reclaiming our ancient homeland. And so the world would call this place the West Bank. If you listen to CNN or BBC, that's what they would call this. Well, why do they call it the West Bank? What's it west of? I mean, it's west, I guess, of Jordan, but Jordan has no claim on this land. So why do they call it the West Bank? That's like a peculiar language. It's an illogical name to call this land. And you look at the Bible, it's called Judea. You look at maps, these are called the Judean mountains. You look at every map around the world, this is called the Judean desert. If it's called Judea, why do they call it the West Bank? And I think that's something really important. Um, why are Jews called Jews? A lot of people think that Jews, you know, whether we be in America or in Hong Kong or in Israel, are called Jews because we're from the tribe of Judah. But that's not true. The first person in the Bible to be called a Jew is Mordechai in the book of Esther. He's called Mordechai HaYehudi, Mordechai the Jew. And then it says, Ish Yemini, but he's from the tribe of Benjamin. The Bible says it clearly. If he's from the tribe of Benjamin, why is he called a Jew? Why are Jews called Jews? So Jews are called Jews because we're from Judea. This land, these mountains, gave the Jewish people our name. We are named after this place. So when the world says, West Bank occupying settlers, evacuate the West Bank, really what they're saying is, Jews, get out of Judea. And that's a little bit more difficult to say. I mean, if a Jew doesn't have a right to live in Judea, where can a Jew live in the world? And that's really what we're doing here. We're returning to ourselves. We're returning to Judea. And as we return to this place, we're opening up our doors to the world to allow that return to infect, um, to influence um, and infect change, hopefully to bring a new light into the world. So you weren't born in Israel, I think? No, well, my grandfather was born in Bialystok because, you know, the temple was destroyed and the Jews were exiled around the world. So my family somehow ended up in the Russia-Polish border. And in 1916, he walked from Russia to Israel. It took him about a year and a half, and he arrived in the early 1900s. My father was born in Jerusalem uh, before 1948, and then he went to study to become a doctor in the United States. I was born in that little window of opportunity um, at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and then when I was 10 years old, my family came back to Israel. So although I was born in the United States, my roots are here. I'm far more Israeli than I am American. So you didn't make Aliyah in that sense to Israel, but you decided to um, was, there, was there a particular event that made you decide you want to move here? Or? Yeah, well, um, I heard that there were two farmers that started this incredible project, and I was told by the mayor to come out here and see if I could help them out. And I came out here, and I stood just right here, and I looked over these mountains, and I saw these ridges, and I saw what they were doing. And, um, you know, every once in a while you feel an intuition that uh, is more than just a gut instinct. It feels like a calling from above. And it was uh, my opportunity to seize the moment and uh, to be called out here to build up Judea and to open this place up to the world. So it was, uh, it was one of those moments that you know, changed your life. So my community, the Christadelphians, has been very interested in the return of the Jews. We wrote about it from the very beginning of our community in the 1850s. And we're very interested in the fulfillment of prophecy. Do, do you see the fulfillment of prophecy having anything to do with what you're doing? Oh my goodness, of course. You know, I told you that the prophet Amos, uh, that community over there is named after him. And so the last few passages in the book of Amos, it says, Veshavti et shvut ami, and I will return the captivity of my people Israel. And they will rebuild wasted cities, and they will plant gardens and eat of their fruit, and plant vineyards and drink of their wine, never to be removed from this land again. And right down here in this valley, we have 2,000 vines of grapes. And all along the side of the mountain, now we have about 4,000 fruit trees, gardens. And you imagine that. Amos had this vision that one day the Jewish people would return to this land. And in the place that he had that vision, we're building the vision that Amos had. And so this is the most tangible realization of prophecy that I've ever touched in my life. So yes, the Jewish people are returning to the land of Israel. But now we're really getting settled in. And Amos says never to be removed from this land again. And it seems as though all the world has often come together to take the Jews out of Judea. But Amos promises. He says that once we're here and we start planting vineyards and fruit trees, we'll never be removed from this land again. So it is living prophecy, definitely. So it's part of a process. What's that process? Where is this all heading? 
Well, I think ultimately it's towards the redemption of the whole world. I think that uh, if you look at the world today, there's so much confusion. You know, boys can't be boys and girls can't be girls in the United States. And Islam is infiltrating into Europe with, uh, you know, beheading people and ISIS. There's so much darkness in the world right now. And there's one light of progress. There's one light of freedom. And it's in Israel. And we were strategically located in the darkest region in the world, surrounded by Syria and Lebanon, bordered with Iran. I mean, you know, we're just in a very dark region. But I believe that this process um, is all about redeeming the whole world, bringing a new light into the world, reminding the whole world that we're created in the image of God and that there's a purpose to this world. And that it's, we're here to fix it. And we're here to bring that light into the world. So ultimately... How is this age different, say, or is it different than when the Jews returned from Babylon or at other times in history? How is, is this age different than those times? Is there something very special about this time? Well, it's really interesting. I think a lot of there are a lot of parallels between those times and these times. And I think a lot of the prophecies that were spoken of were fulfilled in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. And once again, they're being fulfilled through us. The Jewish people have a tradition that there is no third in Gaza. This is the last and final one. And so as we return this time, uh, we're not just returning to Judea. Ultimately, we're returning to Jerusalem. And our goal is ultimately to build a kingdom, a taken olam de malchut shaddai, to fix the world in the kingdom of God. As one person, you know, you can save a whale. As one person, you can, uh, you know, recycle your newspapers. But if you really want to fix the world, you need a kingdom. And I think that's the ultimate purpose here in Israel, is that we're building a Jewish um, country that's based on the vision of the prophets. And I think this time, this is the one that's going to change the world. There's something about this place that um, seems to create a special type of person, maybe a special type of Jew in the, in the land of Judea and Samaria, maybe because of the terrorism, because maybe it takes a little extra faith uh, to live in these places. Do you think there is a special character in, in these mountains? Coming out here has changed my life entirely. I feel like a totally different person now. You know, I feel like sometimes I look at my Jewish brothers and sisters outside of Israel living in Canada. And, um, you know, a fish only has like a 30-second memory. So you take a fish out of the riverbank and you throw him onto the side. Um, he's kind of flopping around, gasping for air. After 30 seconds, he already forgot what it was to be a fish in the water. And they start to think, like, this is what it is to be a fish. You're just gasping for air, flopping around, just waiting to die. And I look at the Jewish people outside of the land of Israel, and they're disappearing. They're uninspired. And coming back to Judea, it's like taking that fish and throwing him back into the water. And it's like, oh, this is what it is to be a Jew. This is what it is to live in this land. It's like we forgot what it was to be a Jew. You know, I, I had a, a group from Hungary that just came out here a few weeks ago. And, you know, because of... Uh, situation in which we live, I, I walk around with a, with a Glock 17, and one of the people came up to me and said, you know, Rabbi, I've never seen a rabbi in Hungary walk around with a gun before. Is it normal for Jews to walk around with guns in Israel? And I said, listen, there's probably not a Jew in the country that wants to walk around with a gun, but, you know, King David, as he walked through these mountains, he had a slingshot. Nehemiah, when he was building up Jerusalem, he had a sword by his side, and so it's returning to a biblical Jew. Like, who we are as a people was not just um, people of the book, but we were people of the sword. King David was a mighty warrior, and his men were, were you know, incredible uh, soldiers. And so the IDF today is the most respected military in the Middle East, one of the most effective armies in the world. And so the Jewish people, like, coming back to this land and coming back to this place, it's, it's coming back to ourselves. So there's a, a Jewish tradition that... Um Elijah the prophet will one day come. Would you be surprised if he ever came here? Um, it's not just a Jewish tradition. I mean, that's a prophecy in the book of Malachi. It says that he's going to come and uh, announce the great day. Yeah, I, I think that we're just, a, you know, it's just a matter of time. You know, when we first came back to this land, Israel was, you know, a godless movement. The Zionist movement were people that um, were an anti-God movement. And there were 60,000 Jews that first came here, you know, in like the early 1900s with my grandfather. And today, Israel has more synagogues 
than ever before in Israel's history, more Torah institutions and more Torah study than ever before, more in the days of Solomon, more than the days of the Maccabees. Israel's becoming a more religious country, and we have now over 6.5 million Jews here. And so to see an exponential growth from 60,000 to 6.5 million, there's never been a population explosion anywhere else in the world like what we're seeing today in Israel. The, the economic empire that Israel has become with really no natural resources, um, it's not really much water here, and uh, we've made this barren land into a paradise. And so Elijah the prophet coming, maybe a few weeks from now, maybe a few months from now, a year from now? Two years? But it's right around the corner. I mean, we've waited 2,000 years. We can wait a few more months. So, uh, um, sometimes when I talk to people and I say that um, the return to the land proves that the Word of God is true. Um, and they might say to me, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Jews came back trying to fulfill prophecy. What would you say to them? Somebody said that to you. Um, it's true. I would say that the Jews came here with a vision of the prophets, and that was that's what guided us. But the fact that we were able to do it is a miracle of God. To survive the Holocaust, where one third of our people were killed, somehow stragglers, Holocaust survivors, and refugees from Arab countries somehow gathered together in 1948, and then were attacked by five Arab armies, and the Jews were able to somehow defeat five trained militaries with no air force, no tanks barely any guns, no uniform. It was just a bunch of guys with shirts and pants and spitball guns and paper airplanes. And somehow um, we declared our independence. And so our return here is, um, was guided by the prophets of Israel, absolutely. But the fact that we were able to fulfill those words and see Jews from Russia and Ethiopia and America, the whole world, um, it is the fulfillment to see the hidden hand of God in reality. Um, thank you very much for talking to me. Great, my pleasure. Awesome. And I just want you to know, brothers and sisters, that that's completely unedited. I didn't, you know, I didn't take anything out. That's exactly everything he said is, is what you just heard. And, uh, you know, maybe there's some things that we as Christadelphians you know, might wonder why a Jew would carry a gun. I mean, we're conscious objectors, but the people like Jeremy Gimple, they're not in the New Covenant. They don't, they're not following the words of Christ. They don't understand those things that we understand. And in their situation, that you can see why, why they have to do what they do. But just absolutely incredible to see a Jew living in that place with those beliefs of the prophets, that this is leading to the redemption of the whole world. That in order to do that, you need a kingdom. And that we're waiting for the Messiah. And that Elijah the prophet could walk into this place. And I expect that to happen. Somebody like Jeremy Gimple may not have the truth completely. But what a change that is from what he said, the first Jews that came back that were anti-God. And look where things are going now it's absolutely amazing brothers and sisters so i asked him that question would you be surprised if elijah the prophet walked in here and just down the hill from where we're speaking he's they're building this torah education center and i can't help but think you know this could be for a lot more than what jeremy gimpel realizes because we know that israel was changed at the time of samuel by the schools of the prophets and we believe that Elijah will come, as it says in Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall restore the heart of the fathers upon the children and the heart of the children upon their fathers. And that's what he's expecting to happen. He's expecting that to happen. In the prophets, we, we see that a stony heart has to be changed to a teachable heart. In Zechariah, it tells us that they made their hearts like an adamant stone. At the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says their hearts were hardened and they could not understand. Deuteronomy says they had a heart that could not perceive. But the new covenant and the work of the new covenant is writing the law 
in their hearts. And that's a different kind of heart. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, the verse on the bottom of the screen and the prophecies of restoration, the prophet says, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart, a teachable heart. So as the Jews come back to the land, we should see a change in their heart. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And I'm going to show you one more short clip of uh, Jeremy Gimple as we, he was touring around. And unfortunately, this was just taken with the microphone on my camera. So some of the there's a bit of noise, uh, wind noise. But I've put some of the words on the screen where they were difficult to hear so that you'll be able to hear that. And he's talking about First Kings chapter three, where it talks about Solomon and how Solomon asked for a, uh, a heart, uh, a, a wise heart. And he, and he talks about the Hebrew text and how that that means a listening heart. A Lev Shomea. So you'll hear him talk about that. Um, and he's talking within uh, a house of worship that they've made on their property. Um, and he's talking about what that um, is and why they, uh, why they built that. From the book of Kings, at least in the Hebrew, he doesn't ask for wisdom. He asks for a Lev Shomea, for a listening heart. And that's different than wisdom. Wisdom is, you know, a, a, a high IQ. But a listening heart is the ability to tune in to the direction that Hashem gives you. How does Hashem speak to us? He says, Hashem, I've got a lot of decisions I need to make. I'm the king. Do I go out to war? Do I not go out to war? Do I take taxes? Do I not take taxes? Do I go right? Do I go left? I'm the king. How am I going to know what to choose? Please, I just want a listening heart that I'll be able to listen to you when I make my decisions. And really, that is the heartbeat, I believe, of what it is to be a Jew. So, brothers and sisters, here we have somebody in the land of Israel who is asking God and saying, God, I want to listen to you. I don't understand everything. I need your direction in my life. God, please give me a listening heart so I can listen to your word and understand it. And that's exactly what Ezekiel said, that the Jews would come back to the land and that their heart would be changed from an adamant stone to a heart that was a heart of flesh, a teachable heart. A listening heart. That's a heart that can have the new covenant engraved upon it. And when the realization of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for that nation dawns upon people like that, it's going to make such an earthquake. It's going to make such an amazing change that it will be absolutely unbelievable. And this is exactly where 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 20 happened. We, we talked about that. That they rose early in the morning and they went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And Jehoshaphat said, hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And here is somebody that believes in the prophets. And exactly where Jehoshaphat said those words, they're working to try and fulfill the words of Amos and, and seeing those words come to pass. And the amazing thing about this is this is exactly where John the Baptist was when he grew up. We're just uh, just over from Hebron, and that's probably where John the Baptist's family was from, where Zachariah and Elizabeth were Levites, and Hebron was a Levitical city, and it was in the hill country of Judah, we know, we know from the Gospels. And so John the Baptist grew up in the deserts, in these deserts. It tells us in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, that the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. It tells us in, in Matthew, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And that's exactly where we are, in the wilderness of Judea by Tekoa in the wilderness of Ziph. And saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So in the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it all started in this place. In this wilderness is where the word of God came first, not to all the rulers 
not to the high ups as it as it tells us in Luke, but the word of God came to John in the wilderness. And today in that wilderness, we have people that are saying, God, we have a listening heart. We want an intimate relationship with you, God. We want to hear what your word is saying to us and praying and believing in what they understand from the prophets. To me, brethren and sisters, this is such an amazing sign of the times. And how long is it before the Lord Jesus Christ says, I see that because it's his hand that's making these things happen. I see that and I'm going to send prophets and teachers to you so that there will be a nucleus or basis for future operations as that kingdom becomes the kingdom of Christ and goes out from Zion into all the world. I just want to finish with one verse from Amos, which is such an exhortation to us. At that time, the prophet is speaking of judgment. But the prophet Amos says, Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. And that's today, but it's different today. Um, that the words of the prophet ap- apply to people like Jeremy Gimpo, who are in, in, the, in their understanding preparing to meet their God, preparing for that Elijah the prophet is going to come, preparing that the Messiah is going to come. But how much more should those words mean to us, brethren and sisters, as we sit here in, in America, we don't want to be like that fish that's out of the water for a few minutes and forgets the word of God, and that's what flesh is like. It's the example that Jeremy Gimpo used. But we need to remember the words of that prophet as they apply to us as we see these things happening and prepare to meet our God because we can see by these signs how close we are to that great day. Thank you.